If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Luke chapter 15. Luke chapter 15, it is Father's Day. Today I want to talk to you about the Christian father. The Christian father. There's an outline in your bulletin there. If you want to follow along with us, uh, be sure and uh, turn there and uh, take notes if you choose to do that. And uh, I forgot a couple of things real quick. I just want to say uh, uh, to the guest, if you will fill that card out for us and take it back, we have a welcome you know, table right through here and hand that card to them. They will give you a free coffee mug. All right. So uh, that's just a way of thanking you uh, for coming this day. And then Brother Steve and Brother Cody will be gone this week. So I'm all you have, folks, this week. All right. Full time, I'm all you got. Of course, we got office staff, we got uh, heads of deacons, uh, we got people that want to serve. And if we can help you in any way this week, uh, please, uh, you know, let us know. The Christian Father. You know, Luke chapter 15 has a specific topic in mind. Jesus shares three stories in this chapter one of the lost sheep, one of the lost coin, and one of the lost sons. I find it interesting that the parable of the prodigal son is only recorded in Luke's gospel. Prodigal means wayward or wasteful. The first part of the story, the focus is on the son. The second part of our story, the focus is on the father. Let's look at this amazing story to see a great example of a Christian father. And remember, a parable is an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. This ungrateful son was about to learn three things about sin. And we need to understand these three things. Uh, men especially, uh, we are the anchor. We are the guide. We are the spiritual you know, uh, person uh, in our lives. We need to uh, lead our families away from sin. And one thing, it says, sin will take you farther than you really want to go. It will keep you longer than you really want to stay and it will cost you more than you want to pay. I don't know any better example than the prodigal son in our text. The Christian father, we have three uh, points I want to share with you. Number one is always approachable. Always approachable. And keep God in mind. We're, we're, we're going with the story. Jesus told this story. But I told you earlier, I think I might even prayed it. God is the perfect father. God is the perfect father. A Christian father is always approachable. Number two, a Christian father is always forgiving. Always forgiving, and sometimes it's hard to forgive. But it is not impossible to forgive. And I will share that with you in just a few minutes. Number three, a Christian father is always compassionate. Folks, I am telling you, love is the key to relationships. Love. Even Jesus said, by love, people will know that we are disciples of Jesus Christ. So let's look at this familiar story, and the Christian father is always approachable. Then he said, and Jesus, again, is speaking here. It's in red letters. A certain man had two sons, and the younger one said to his father, Father, give me the portion of my goods that falls to me. Now let me stop right here. <laughs> If I told that to my father, he would ask me, are you crazy? Have you lost your mind? You're not getting anything, okay? I, and again, my father was a good father. He was a Christian father. He was a deacon. He taught Sunday school. But that would not be said in my house. I wouldn't ask him in the first place, all right? But the key here is younger son. The portion of his goods was one-third. The portion of the elder's son was two-thirds. And the father owed them nothing. Okay? And here's the deal, folks. Money hurts families sometimes. When my mom passed away, my father passed away first, I told my three sisters, and I was totally honest, and they knew what I meant. I do not care if I get a dime because my parents earned that money. 
and I am not going to let money hurt my relationship with my three sisters. Not going to do it. All right, I'm not living. I wasn't living for an inheritance. Folks, God supplies all my needs. And so you have to understand this young man had a money problem. And he was wanting money that wasn't his. He didn't work for it. Okay? It was his father's. And notice what it says. And not many days after, the younger son gathered uh, all together, journeyed to a far country, and there wasted his possessions with prodigal living. So we see he had a money problem, but another thing that he had was an authority problem. An authority problem. I know, uh, you know, a lot of times, even when I was growing up, I didn't think my parents knew as much as I, looking back, realized what they did know. They knew a whole lot more than I did. They were a whole lot smarter than I was. And folks, I am telling you, God places authorities, figures, and authority in our life to help us to avoid pitfalls in life. So he had a money problem. Uh, hold your finger there and go to 2 Timothy. Or 1 Timothy, excuse me. 1 Timothy 1. Let's see what the Bible says. 1 verse 6. Chapter, excuse me, chapter 6, verse 6. 1 Timothy 6.6. 6. Now godliness with contentment is great gain. It's not a sin to have money. It's a sin to love that money. I've seen people get off airplanes and run to the screen to find out what the stocks were doing. Folks, you're obsessed with money if that's what you do, okay? You need money. There's, there's, and, and we'll, the, well, the word, the, the word will explain it. For we brought nothing into the world, and it's certain we can carry nothing out. How much you taking with you? Zero. Zero dollars. You can bury it with you, but it's going to stay in the ground, folks. Anybody wants to be buried in a Cadillac, give me the Cadillac, okay? It ain't going to heaven with you. And having food and clothing with these shall be content. Notice the two times contentment and content. Folks, we do not have content people and content Christians. We ought to be happy with what we have. And instead of dwelling on what we don't have, we need to think and, 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 you know, think in our minds. Think of all that you do have. I woke up today. I got to go to church today. I'm sitting in a sanctuary where it is cool. I didn't have to walk to church. I didn't have to ask for money to put gas in. I will eat some food. You can go on and on and on of the things and the blessings we take for granted. My Bible says, my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory. And we get wants and needs mixed up. And this young man was confused. He acted like his father owed him this. Let me stop right here. There's a word I want to use, and it just gets under my skin. Entitlement. Folks, God owes you nothing. If he saved you, he saved your life for forever and ever and ever. And let's see what it says. Verse 9, but those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a, stare, and a snare and into many foolish and harmful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. Is that not exactly what is happening here? Okay? Young buck, 19 years old, 18 years old, had heard about the life in the far city, heard about the parties and, and all that was going on there. And he thought, you know, today it'd be like, hey, I'm going to Las Vegas with every penny I got. Well, folks, I could tell you the Bible says you are a fool to do that. All right? God has given you that. Now, here's the key. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. It does not say money is evil. Okay? How you use that money can be evil. And he's simply saying, 
Folks, we need to be content with what we have, and we are not entitled to things. Whereas this generation, folks, I'm telling you, it is their word, entitlement, for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. So what did he do? He got his money. His dad did not say no. His dad, I, and, and again, there's two schools of thought here. He thought, okay, you know, this is what he wants to do. I don't want him to be miserable here. I'm going to give what he might get later on down the road. Okay, all I know is my father would have looked at me and, and he, he would just laugh. He just said, you're out of your mind. But he chose to give that to his son. The son went and wasted it. Did not have to work. Had money to eat. Had money to party. Had money to stay in hotels. Had money to do all this. But here's a key, folks. When you don't work, eventually you're not going to eat. Money runs out. Money runs out. And it says in verse 14, but when he had spent all, uh, there was, uh, arose a severe famine in the land, and he began to want. Then he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, in a foreign country possibly, in a, uh, to a person that he did not know, and he sent him to the fields to feed swine. And do you understand Jewish people, how unclean a swine was. Folks, the guy, and, and Jesus said it, whatever a man sows, he will also reap. He had a good home. He had a good father. He had a roof over his head. He could work. He had it made at home, but thought the grass was greener on the other side, and it cost him dearly. And it says, and he would gladly have filled his stomach with the pods that the swine ate, and no one gave him anything. When he had all the money, he was something. When he was spending the money and buying drinks for folks and just throwing that money around like he had plenty of it, he was somebody. But he did not realize that there is a payday someday, folks. And he went against uh, his authority, which was his father. Look at Ephesians 6. Ephesians 6. Ephesians 6. Look at verse 1. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Folks, that's honor your father and mother. Was, it, it was, it's a commandment. So listen to me, children. Listen to me, young people. Listen to me if you are living at home, all right? If you are living at home, you are under the authority of your mother and your father, and you need to obey them. When you get out on your own, you can do what you want, okay? But keep honoring your parents. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise. What is that promise? That it may be well with you, and you may live long on the earth. I mean, this person, basically, this prodigal son went out on the street. He was homeless. He was broke. He was feeding pigs. And he got so hungry that pig slop looked good. I don't know about you, but I've never been that hungry. I've never been. But I am telling you, his father was teaching him a lesson his heavenly father was teaching him a lesson. Folks, I knew in my heart of hearts, all three of my sisters got married when they graduated high school and they were 18 years old. I hung on to 20 till I was 22. Man, I had a roof over my head. I had three hot meals a day and my mom even took care of making my bed. I am ashamed of that at 22. But this guy... This guy thought he knew better, and God allowed this to happen in his life. So we see this man was approachable. He could talk to his father. He could ask this favor from his father, and his father chose to do that. And the second thing I want you to see, it's not, a, not only is the Christian father always approachable, he is always 
forgiving. He was always forgiving. And folks, this is so important. Look at verse 17. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have bread enough to spare, and I perish with hunger? What did he do? He had time to think about it. What did he do? He was broke. What did he do? He got to thinking, you know, maybe it's not so bad back home. Maybe I should have thought this through a little better. Probably had not cut his hair. Probably had not had a bath lately. And he realized that, man, I really did have it better at home. And folks, it's sad that some people have to go out into the world and they have to try the world when the Bible tells us, you know, don't buy the worldly goods. Don't buy the philosophies of the lost. Don't follow, uh, you, know, you know, what the world does and, and what society says is okay. Folks, we need to go by the Word of God. We need to base our life on the Word of God. And this, man, and this young uh, buck realized, you know, I did have it made. I was better off at home. And he says, notice, notice that I perish with hunger. I will arise and go to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. You talk about an attitude adjustment. <laughs> God gave him an attitude adjustment. He realized what he was doing was wrong. Folks, why cannot we do the same with our Heavenly Father? God knows everything we do. And I'll even take it a step further. God knows everything we think. We have to be honest with God, folks. We have to be honest with God. God is a forgiving God. God is a loving God. God does things to help us and to grow us into mature Christians. And this young man found out really quick that he had it made at his house. He had made a huge mistake, and he wanted to make things right. And do you know what keeps us from asking someone for forgiveness? Folks, it is pride. It is pride. I grew up in the happy days. And I never will forget old Fonzie doing something wrong. And you know how you laughing, or my age or older, I, I got you right here. But he was going, I was wrong, wrong. I was wrong, wrong. He couldn't say it. Well, I got news for you, folks. Fonzie was wrong, okay? He wasn't perfect. But our God is never wrong. His word is always truth. And this young man needed to learn a lesson in asking for forgiveness. And do you know what a huge problem people have in life? They know God can forgive them, but they have trouble forgiving themselves. Folks, we all make mistakes. When I was 18 and 19, I was the prodigal son. I grew up in church, and I walked away from God for about 18 months. And I knew the whole time what I was doing was wrong. But my Heavenly Father forgave me. My Heavenly Father Save me. Because, folks, there is a thing called a false profession of faith. It is in Matthew chapter 7. And I realized for the first time I was a lost church member. And I had to ask my parents to forgive me because of my actions and my words. I went back to church and I didn't rededicate my life because you have to have something to rededicate. I went back to church and I asked God to save me. I was not living like a Christian. I was not doing what I should do. 
But I am telling you, at the age of 22, God turned my life around. He changed me from the inside out. Psalm 103. Psalm 103. Look, look at this is speaking of God. Psalm 103, verse 8. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in mercy. He will not always strive with us, nor will he keep his anger forever. He has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor punished us according to our iniquity. There's always a price to pay, folks. There's always a line. You can cross a line. I believe there is a sin unto death according to 1 John. But he is waiting for you to come home. He's waiting you to get back to do what you know you need to be doing. Now look at verse 11. For as high as the heaven, for as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his mercy to those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. As a father pitieth his children, so the Lord pities those who uh, fear him. Oh, folks, there is forgiveness in our Heavenly Father. There's forgiveness in our lives, folks. And, and we, as Christians, when someone wrongs us and they ask for forgiveness, we need to forgive them. Why? Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. Go with me to Matthew 6. Matthew 6. And you have to realize this is the Lord's Prayer. This is the model prayer. And we know the model prayer. But go down to verse 14. For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men of their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Folks, God forgave you when you got saved of every sin that you will ever commit, that you had committed, and every sin that you will commit. God forgave you for that. God's love is unconditional love. Even the disciples were trying to figure it out one day talking to Jesus. And, and one of them looked at Jesus and said, hey, how many times do I have to forgive somebody? Okay, y'all want to know the bottom line. How many times do I have to do this? Well, I got news for you. You don't have to forgive them one time. But you're not smart if you don't forgive. Because the Bible says here, if you want God's forgiveness, if you want forgiveness in your life, you need to forgive others. If someone genuinely asks for forgiveness, you need to forgive them. Jesus looked at the disciples and said, I'll give you a number, 70 times 7. And folks, <laughs> he did not mean start marking them down. And when you get to 490 of them, you don't have to forgive them. He's saying, if someone, or if I have forgiven you, if God has forgiven you, we need to forgive others. Folks, it will change your life. I know many people that live in bitterness because of something that happened 10, 20, or 30 years ago. And I realize you can't forget it. I understand you know, it's hard. You just can't erase that from your mind. But you can have victory over that to where when you think about that, it's not affecting your walk with God and your walk with others. God allows things in your life. He allows tragedies in your life. He allows, you know, bad things to, in your life so that you can be a testimony of what Christians are supposed to do. So I am telling you, folks, this deal on forgiveness is so, so important. But if you do not forgive men of their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive you. So look back in our text. And it says, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. You know what this young man had? I love it when I see this an attitude adjustment. My father had to adjust my attitude more than once. All right? And I knew I was going to be a preacher. 
Because he says, can you ever keep your mouth shut? (laughs) Can you ever not have the last word in? And I tried my best. And it just wouldn't happen. And God took what probably is a weakness in my life. And this is God, folks. He made it a strength. I took speech my senior year, second semester uh, semester in college, because I did not like to talk in front of people. And of all things, God has a sense of humor. He gave me, (laughs) you're welcome. Uh, He gave me the debate coach as my speech chief. And I gave a speech one time, my first speech. He looked at me and he said, did you write that this morning? That was terrible. That is the worst one I've ever heard. Now, I, I kind of got upset about that. But then a girl got up and she gave one and, she, and, and he basically made her cry. I did not cry at least, okay? And here's what he said to me when he gave me my report card. You probably made a D in this class, but I'm going to give you a C minus because I don't want to see you again. <laughs> Speech in college. And I am not a debater. I am not the most gifted speaker. But I'm telling you, God speaks through me. God speaks through his word. Forgive and you will be forgiven. There are too many people that have this burden of guilt all over their life because they will not forgive. Please, please, forgive. You will be a better person. You will be a happier person if you forgive. Number three, the Christian father is always compassionate. And he rose and came to his father. But when he was still a great way off, his father saw him, had compassion on him, ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. My goodness. Can you imagine this guy being gone, this kid, this son of yours, you're not knowing where he's at. You don't know whether he's dead or alive. He probably come back with long hair and shaved, didn't shave. He probably, you know, working in that pig slop stunk. And the father did not say, when you apologize to me, when you get a haircut and you get a shave and you be my slave or my worker again, then we'll talk. He forgave his son. He forgave his son. Why? Because the father thought his son might be dead. We don't have time to go to the rest of the story, but that's what he said. And it says, and the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I am no no longer worthy to be called your son. And folks, that was a true statement. But listen to the father's response. But the father said to his servant, bring out the best robe, put it, put it on him, put a ring on his hand, put sandals on his feet, which tells me he didn't even have shoes when he came back. His clothes were probably torn and soiled. And bring the fatted calf here and kill it. And let's eat and be merry. For this my son was dead, was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found, and they began to be merry. There's a twofold application to this story, and one is to the lost. Folks, before you were saved, you were dying in your trespasses and in your sin. But God's mercy and God's grace saved you. It, folks, we, I, I could not live another day without the forgiveness of God in my life. I thank you that I can take all my burdens and all my weaknesses and all my foolishness to God, and I can sincerely ask God to forgive me. But there's also an application to the saved. And that application to the saved is... Folks, we need to understand 
when people treat us wrong. All right? We need to let it go. Let it go. Not get on the phone. Not tell everybody what they have done to you. Don't try to get even. The Bible tells us that vengeance is mine, thus saith the Lord. Hand it to God and get your hands off of it. And I know what some of you say, well, I, I, I'm not letting anybody walk over me. I'm not going to let anybody clean their feet on me. Folks, think of Jesus Christ. He had done nothing. Absolutely did not sin. Never. But yet on a cross, crucified, beaten, within an inch of his life, said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. It was my sin that crucified Christ. It was my sin that hurt him deeply. It was my sin. And folks, we will never be able to repay God and Jesus for what they had done. So here today as we close, I just want to ask you, and, and again, folks, I'm talking to Christian fathers. We need to be approachable. Our kids and our grandkids need to be able to talk to us. We need to be forgiving. We don't need to hold a grudge. We don't need to hold it over them. And folks, I believe in discipline. I believe in discipline. But once the discipline, and again, let me, let me preface this. Do not discipline out of anger. If you've got an anger issue, you need to go cool off and then discipline a child. Okay? And the next thing, folks, we need to be compassionate. We need to be forgiving uh, to those who hurt us. Ephesians 2, and I close with this. Ephesians 2, verse 4. But God, I like that word but. Wherever you see but, it's fixing to change a thought. There is a transition here. But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses and sin. We weren't sin sick, folks. We were dead. We were dead in our, we were dead spiritually. He made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. You need to thank God for grace and mercy in your life. There was a time when my dad was whooping me. See, there are spankings and then there are whoopings. And my dad didn't believe in negotiation. He didn't believe in timeout. All right? He would laugh today with timeout. Matter of fact, I've told you this before. He knocked me out one time. That was his timeout <laughs> by what I said. Folks, I'm telling you, we are under God's mercy and we are under his grace. And we need to thank God every day for that. By grace you have been saved and raised together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come, that he might show his exceedingly riches of his grace and in his kindness towards us in Christ. What is he talking about? Folks, we're going to spend eternity with him forever. We are a child of a king. He is going to take us. We just finished the book of Revelation. It's all true. We're all going to heaven. It is a perfect place. And we get that as a free gift from him. And here's what it says. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and not that of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. You can't work your way in heaven. You can't clean up enough. You can't change enough. You can't give enough. You can't attend church enough to be saved. It is God's grace that saves you. It is believing in the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior and as your Lord. For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in Him. So the invitation is twofold today. You're here today and you've never experienced the grace and mercy of God. I'm telling you, if you're a father especially, you would do good 
you would do good to accept Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord. That way you would have the tools, you would have the Holy Spirit, you would have that guidance in your life to help you to raise your family. Then it's also talking to the saved Father. And folks, it, it, it means it to everyone what I'm saying is, it is Father's Day, but this application is for everyone. It is for everyone. Maybe today you need to rededicate your life to Christ, or you need to come for baptism, or you need to come for church membership. You've been coming here, you know who we are, you know what we're about, and God spoke to you. If He speaks to you today, would you listen to His voice? Father, thank you for this day, and God, I thank you so much for your mercy and your grace. God, I truly believe that fathers want to do the right thing, but sometimes, God, we get distracted. Sometimes we don't have that power, and God, I pray first and most of all that we would check our salvation. God, I, that we would make sure that we know that we are Christians, and if we were to die today, we would go to heaven. And God, if there's a conviction that we're not, I pray that you would give us courage as men to walk down the aisle and put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ. And God, I pray to all the Christians out there, God, if you told us we need to rededicate our lives, these altars are going to be open. You can come and pray and you can walk away or you can come and pray with us. Whatever God wants you to do, God, we are listening, we are hearing, and we are going to obey. God, this is your church. This is your invitation. You do with it what you choose. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand to your feet? If God has spoke to you in any way, would you come?